Good evening, and welcome to the opening keynote talk of the third biennial conference, Timber in the City. Uh, my name is David Lewis, and I'm first going to turn on the mic so you can hear me. Uh, my name is David Lewis. I'm a professor of architecture at Parsons and principal of LTL Architects. I'm very pleased to open this conference tonight and want to start by first thanking the sponsor, the Binational Softwood Lumber Council, led by Case Jagger, for the underwriting of this conference and the parallel student design competition. The competition, also called Timber in the City, organized by Parsons and run through the Association of Collegiate Schools of Architecture, or ACSA, um, this year, the competition, due in the spring of 2019, challenges students as individuals or as teams to reimagine a vacant waterfront site in Queens, New York, as a vibrant and vanguard model of healthy biophilic living for the future of the city, with mass timber as the catalyst for architectural innovation. The presentation tonight and the day-long conference tomorrow a conference that be begins at 10 a.m. Uh, in this very same room uh, and features eight speakers and three moderators, including Tom Chung of Lear's Wines Apple Associates, Michelle Ruloff of Arup, Bill Browning of Terrapin Bright Green, Merritt Buchholz of Buchholz McAvoy Architects of Dublin, Allison Mears of the Healthy Materials Lab, David Lanahan of Lotus Equity, Annie Perkins of the Sustainable Forestry Initiative, and Todd Snap and Julie Michaels of Perkins and Will will provide a touchstone or a lodestar in current political parlance for students, faculty, and practitioners negotiating the future possibilities of architecture and mass timber. Tonight, however, we have an architect who has defined not only the possibility, but executed the built reality of the future of mass timber architecture today. Yet to call Andrew Waugh a timber architect does not fully capture the dynamic capacities of his firm, Waugh Thistleton Architects of London. He is frankly an exceptional architect, whether working through rammed earth for the Bushy Cemetery, up for the 2018 RIBA Sterling Prize, or the conversion of a steel and masonry Victorian electrical substation into Tramshed, a spectacular restaurant complete with a Damien Hurst installation, or in the ongoing urban redevelopment of Sugar House in London to reimagine a 26-acre redevelopment of housing, office, and public space, which, yes, is indeed being realized through timber. In addition to leading his practices since 1997 with Anthony Thistleton, Andrew practices, lectures, and travels extensively, and we are honored to have him here tonight to kick off this conference. Will you please join with me in welcoming Andrew Waugh. Thanks, David. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk to you about the work that we've been doing over the last 15 years. Um, and this is us. I've got to move about a bit, so do that. So this is us. We're War Thistleton Architects. There's me there. And we uh, design and we research and we build in timber as a practice. Now, the reason why we do this and the reason why this started is really just about an understanding as architects of our actions, an understanding of the implications of the work that we do on the environment. So construction is a massive polluter, a massive causer of waste and <clears throat> a massive user of water. And in fact, when we look at the way in which we calculate the carbon footprint of architecture, the way that you do it in the States, the way that we do it in the UK, is by looking at a building's lifespan, 60 years, and then seeing how much carbon that building will emit by the energy it uses over 60 years. So I've done a little graph here. This will be the last graph, I promise. Last but one. So, and this is the operation. So obviously when you start the building now, the operations are zero carbon footprint. And they get to over half after, after 50 years on this graph. The materials that go into that building, obviously that's 100% of the carbon footprint. So the production of cement and concrete is about 12% of all the greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide that goes into the atmosphere, steel, et cetera, et cetera. So the thing is, is that we don't have 50 years. We've got 
more like 17 years until we have to meet the Paris Accords, those things which you're going to have to catch up on in a couple of years' time. And, <clears throat> and so in order to meet the Paris Accords, in order for us all to meet the Paris Accords, we need to actually be looking at the materials that we use, specifically un understanding that those materials on a typical residential, multi-story, multi-family building, those materials are about two-thirds of the carbon footprint of that building by the time we reach Paris. So this is a really important thing that we need to engage with as architects. Now, when I was at college, I was taught that architecture is a political act, a primarily a political act. So in terms of it being a kind of socio-contextual thing to do. So understanding the politics of what it is that you do, the implications of your actions, uh, is about taking this seriously. So what we say in the office is to be part of the solution and not part of the problem. So that started us on a journey on cross-laminated timber. So this is a big material. Everybody knows what CLT is now, don't they? So I don't have to explain that. I used to have to stand up and do like mimes with my hands about how it was made. But it's basically great big massive panels of timber which makes construction really logical and really understandable and really intuitive to an architect. And you know what I was thinking about this the other day is that one of the reasons we started building in cross-laminated timber was because we didn't have a clue how to build. And when you don't have a clue how to build, you go onto site and the contractor just kind of takes over and he takes your drawings, gives them a look, and then sort of throws them in the corner and gets on with what he knows how to do. But actually, you know, being able to be part of the construction process as you are in timber, which I should explain as we go on, is just an incredibly um, rewarding part of this process. So we started, so here's a typical factory. So this is a, a factory in Austria, and you know these panels, they come out of the machinery, they come out of the presses, and then they go into a CNC machine, and the CNC machine cuts out the windows, cuts out the door, cuts out the roof profiles. And the BIM software, the three-dimensional CAD software that we use now, that same file migrates through to the engineer, same file migrates through to the CNC machine. So what we're drawing is actually exactly what gets cut out in the factory. So that kind of connection from architect to building is so immediate, so close. So our first little building that we built in 2003 was, a, it was actually a nightclub for classical musicians. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I've never been back. And, uh, <clears throat> and it's a 45 square meter building, three stories, and we had these prefabricated panels. At this point in 2003, about 3,000 cubic meters of CLT were manufactured every year by two manufacturers. This year it'll be a million cubic meters by 57 different manufacturers, to give you an idea of how fast this is catching on and growing. So I watched, I sat in my car, and watch this building go up. I watched four people build a building in six hours with cordless screwdrivers. And I fell head over heels in love with this process. And then in 2008, between 2003 and 2008, we'd had a lot of refusals, a lot of rejections. We built a couple of private houses. We built some bars and restaurants where we fitted them out with CLT. But in 2008, we had this project um, where it just seemed as though a kind of perfect storm had come together of the right site, the right developer, um, and the right time to build this building. So this is a nine story, eight stories of timber above the ground floor uh, of solid timber. So all the walls, all the floor slabs, all the lift shafts, the, sorry, the elevator shafts and staircases, all made from solid timber. But we had to prove to this client that not that the building was incredibly sustainable and contained many tons of carbon within the material of timber itself, but that actually this building would be faster and less ex expensive, more cost efficient, should we build it in timber. So what we did is we prepared two sets of drawings, we prepared two construction programs, and we prepared two cost uh, kind of analysis, demonstrating that the building would be, would be so much better in timber. And they said that would be fine, and we could build it in timber, we just weren't allowed to tell anyone that we'd built it in timber. So we failed on that thing. So this is it going up here. And <clears throat> um, you know, this is kind of really, a lot of the details that we use here are very similar to the details that we're still using today. So really simple, if you can see like um, three inch galvanized shelf bracket 
with a six inch screw going through it, all fitted together with cordless screwdriver. So these get lifted into place, put down, bracket goes across, and four guys put this building up in 27 days. So nine stories. You can see the tape on the floor. That's to stop the water going from one floor to another while you're actually building the building. And see the kind of little electrical ties here in the ceiling. So what you've got is you've got a guy on stilts going around the construction site on stilts with a cordless screwdriver. And he's drilling these up into the ceiling and then they just run the electrics through. And they were on a 12-week program on this job and after 10 days they'd finished the whole building. And this guy was saying to me, you know, when you apprentice as an electrician in the UK, you spend about the first 18 months of that job, you spend hammer drilling into concrete to, to fix the electrics up into there. And after about 18 months, your shoulder joint disintegrates. And when your shoulder joint is disintegrated, then they teach you about electrics. So we've got a situation here where we're finding these guys running around on stilts with cordless screwdrivers whistling. Not Dixie. <laughs> and these are, so you can see, all, these are the elevator shafts here and here, the staircases going up. No tower crane either. So the whole thing able to, the truck arrives here on a Tuesday full of panels, and the, the mobile crane here picks up the panels, screws them into place. So 27 days, four men. And incredibly quiet too. You can see we're about 28 feet here from uh, neighboring residential windows, and no complaints during the construction. So no jackhammers, no grinders, no cement mixers. In fact, we reduced the amount of construction tra traffic coming to the site uh, by about 80%. So far fewer kind of trucks thundering through the street. And that's it finished. So we finished this 10 years ago. So less waste. Do you know um, in the UK, and I'm sure it's exactly the same here, a third of building materials that arrive on site are thrown away. So 20% of all jobs on a construction site are done wrong and have to be done again. You know, so anyway, this kind of things really fascinate me. So, um, so we built this building here, Murray Grove 2000, and every, every September I stand outside here and I do a little talk about the building and how it was made and stuff like that. And last year, we didn't do it this year, because of the sterling price. <laughs> but last year, we, it was raining, and we had about 20 people. But the year before, it was really sunny, and we had 700 people came and stood outside here in the street. And there's a guy in here in this apartment who's got a parrot on the balcony. And he leaned, leant out of the apartment and shouts things at the people like, it's all made of timber. And uh, <laughs> really handy stuff, stealing my thunder. And, uh, and also things like, um, I can't hear my neighbors and um, I've never used my central heating, and other really handy things like that. So we're kind of beginning as we kind of get this, you know, sort of this journey of discovery about the kind of buildings that we're building and how those buildings perform. So last year, we built our biggest project so far, which was 100, I'm really quickly converting here from metric into imperial, so you have to kind of go with me a bit, but 175,000 square feet building, 121 apartments, and 105 feet tall. So all made of timber from the first floor up. So you can see here, this is the building, the tall point here. And you can see what we're doing. We're learning how to do things now. Now the software is a lot better, and we're getting better at what we do. So the first one on Murray Grove, all the calculations for that building were done with a pencil on a piece of paper, all the engineering calculations. And now, of course, we're using the same BIM software with the engineer, and we're doing the finite element models with the engineer. So on this one here, the panels at the bottom of the building are six inches thick, and at the top of the building are less than four inches thick. So as the building, as the building goes up, it gets thinner as it goes up. So we're getting really efficient. Even these things here, you see these little rails here? That's actually integrated into the panel at the back, and when the guy comes to fit the window, he gets a chainsaw out, chops the rails out, puts them on the floor, puts the window in. So we don't need any guardrails. We're kind of reducing the amount of single-use plastics, all that kind of thing on the construction site. And you can see how fast it was as well. So by the time the train's gone past, we're finished. <laughs> but in all seriousness, the, uh, so the building here, the, the entire structure took five months to build. So two teams of four people took five months to build. And then it took 14 months to clad it in brick. <laughs> and that's it finished. Um, 
Last year as well, we finished a factory, so we're beginning to kind of like diversify. It was always about residential for us, but actually now doing more and more different projects. So uh, last year we finished this building for Vitsu, who's a, a shelving manufacturer. I don't know if you know these shelves here. They're very beautiful. Architects love them. Made by Dieter Rams and designed by Dieter Rams in 1960. And one of the things about the shelving system, the idea is it's very expensive, but you can keep, you take it with you. You know when you move house, you take the shelves with you. So they're very beautiful, very hard wearing. And our brief for this project was to build a building that worked like the shelves worked. So in doing that, um, <clears throat> we have this building, which is all top lit. So all these are open lights, you see in a minute. So the whole external uh, structure of the building is completely made from softwood CLT. But the interior of the building, these beams and these posts here, these columns here, they're made of hardwood CLT. Because what we've begun to learn and to understand is that different types of timber cut in different ways and stuck together in different ways can do different jobs. So this is using beech. And the beech, instead of being uh, sawn into planks, the beech is peeled from a tree, like a veneer, like plywood. Now if you imagine that, that, um, that timber, is like glass, is made of long strands, and if you cut it like a plank, then you cut those strands and you weaken them. But if you peel it, you peel the strands in one piece. So the veneer is incredibly strong. And then you layer up those veneers from that hardwood and you have a timber material that's stronger than steel in terms of its size. So if this beam had been in steel, it would have been larger than it is in beech. So completely hardwood LVL, eight month build, what we did with the foundation, so it doesn't have any proper foundation, well, has a proper foundation, obviously it doesn't have any traditional foundation in it, in the sense that what we did is we got a plow and a tractor, and we plowed up the slab, we plowed up the ground, and sprinkled cement on it, and then turned it into a kind of a, a sort of a primitive concrete raft slab. And then we dug just pad foundations under each one, so a very small amount of concrete used in the foundation of the building. But also you can see where the beams and the columns are here. We didn't use any metal plates to connect those. They're actually like a hook and eye joint. So the, the, the beam just slides down on top, of the, on top of the column. So the tolerance for the building was plus or minus one millimeter. I don't know what that is in Imperial, but it's really small, like a fingernail. So that's it inside. I mean, I say it's a factory. It's not really a factory. Well, it is a factory because they make things there, but there's also a ballet school in it as well. So you can see the whole thing is a top lit. And you can see also we use steel here in this area just to support these windows because that was the only area in the building, the only part of the building where actually steel would perform better than timber. So we thought we'd use steel just to demonstrate that. And we've also used steel in this building here. So this is an office building where what we've done is we have a steel frame and we're using CLT floor slabs so, and CLT core. So the CLT takes all the shear forces, takes all the wind forces, and the slabs take all the weight of the individual floors. And they also they take up a diaphragm action, so they stop it from twisting. And the steel takes all the load. But because the building's so light, this building weighs about a third of a traditional uh, steel and concrete office building. Because it's so light, the steels themselves are much smaller. So you can see, and very fast building as well. So the whole building from start to finish to being occupied is about 10 months. And that's where Dezine is going. Do you know Dezine? Is anybody? So that's Dezine's office. Um, and then Development House, which is just near us, um, another project using hardwood um, LVL structure here and then um, CLT floor slabs and a CLT lift shaft. And what we're learning, what we've learned with this building and are, and are beginning to learn is that um, because we don't have big heavy concrete buildings that we need to heat up and we don't have big heavy concrete buildings that we need to cool down because these are light timber buildings, we don't need to bring in the same kind of air conditioning systems, the same sort of... Uh, uh, energy, uh, energy wasting, energy using systems. So these buildings are completely naturally ventilated as well. Uh, this one we have going on site uh, in November, and this building um, again is an office building, and uh, has a beach 
LVL frame, and then we're using uh, also a hardwood CLT on the back there. And you can see a very minimal frame going up. So this is the amount of concrete that goes in, the amount of foundations. So about 50% uh, saving on foundation over a traditional office building. So 4,000 square meters, what's that? 42,000 square feet. And uh, that building starts, as I say, in November and should be finished within a year or so. And is also clad as well in, uh, in tulip wood, which grows in the Appalachians and is a really low uh, kind of low value. I'll come on to tulip wood in a sec. Anyway, but this one is thermally modified. So what we do here is this timber is baked in an oven. And after it's baked in an oven for four days, then the timber itself changes its condition and it becomes really durable and waterproof and actually performs like a mahogany or like a teak kind of timber. So then we got into this kind of um, last graph. So then we've, we've, we've been thinking more and more about how we build buildings and who builds the buildings for us and how that works. Now, when England won the World Cup in 1966, uh, <laughs> we were producing buildings at a similar sort of rate to how we are manufacturing other things. But actually, in the 52 years since that happened, manufacturing has increased in productivity by 230%. And construction has been reduced by nearly 20%. So we now make buildings more expensively and more slowly than we did 52 years ago. So something's wrong about this. Now we know from talking to apprenticeship colleges and stuff like that, that when they go out to high schools to talk to kids about coming into construction, kids won't go into construction. They'd rather work in a telephone center. You know, they'd rather pick up a telephone and answer somebody's call. And yet in the UK, if you're a scaffold director in the UK, you get paid $100,000 by the time you're 20. So they just can't get anybody to go into construction. So the people that do go into construction are people that feel as though society has failed them. And if all the people, because you never feel like you failed society, you know, society's always failed you. So, you know, you go into those situations and then you have an industry that's completely staffed by people who actually think that they've been done over, you know, that they've been... Uh, so then you, you... So then, as architects, what we're doing is we're trying to encourage a whole raft of people because really we're nothing without builders you know we can't do anything we can't perform without contractors and yet we have a whole industry that can't work for us i mean look this is a so in 1870 this is how we make cars you know and then this is how we make cars today it's a nissan factory in london but in construction it's how we made houses 150 years ago that's bad math isn't it <laughs> 100 and whatever <laughs> And how we make houses today, appallingly similar. So we've started working um, on this and we started working for a number of different um, prefabrication and modular factories. And I kind of got last year really quite obsessed by this idea of doing this. So this one here, this is, this is like, um, this is a factory which is uh, seven and a half hectares. What's about 25 acres or something crazy is a factory size. They'll make 5,000 homes a year from this factory. Three different ways of making prefabricated industrialized housing. So you can do that flat pack as we've been doing it, or you can make bathrooms, make kitchens, and then put them inside a flat pack building, or you can make volumetric modular housing. So looking at volumetric modular housing in this factory here, we're doing that from solid timber. And one of the interesting things about doing that, if you build a two bedroom apartment from CLT, from cross laminated timber panels, you need about 18 panels to make that apartment. And yet if you build it from light gauge steel, as nearly all of our prefabricated housing is built from, that takes about 600 components. So you can see the difference between making something out of lots of different components or actually uh, having larger panels and then cutting those panels down. And what that allows you to do, because every time the panel goes through the machine, what's informing that machine can be different, but the process remains the same. So each one of those units, each one of those modules can be completely different. Now that allows us to start thinking about choice. So with one of these clients, what we're doing at the moment is we're working with them on a software where when people buy the apartment or when in social housing, when they sign up for that apartment, they can choose what their kitchen is. You know in the UK, I'm sure it's the same here, in the UK, 25% of kitchens in new houses are torn out within the first year of people moving into those homes. 
So you have to ask yourself, why is that? Why do people do that? So actually beginning to give people a choice, beginning to actually work with our clients to um, understand what they want, to give them choice in the housing that they're going to live in, I think is, is a really exciting opportunity and one that I'm not quite sure we've learned how to harness yet. But this, you know, with these houses here, we can give people, we can say, what colour do you want? Different rooms? Uh, what kind of bathroom do you want? In fact, on the apartment building that we're doing now, there's 1.3 million choice combinations on each one of the apartments, which is about the same as an Audi A4. Because you can see that when you design cars here, so this is a, this is a Mitsubishi, Mitsubishi GS platform, and all these cars here are made from exactly the same chassis. So made off the same platform, but all the different cars. So what we're looking at in terms of housing is how we can have those chassis and then really begin to involve people in the choice of what kind of housing they live in. So you know, there's a sort of, um, I was told by a developer once that, that my job was to, uh, was to build housing to a sufficiently mundane standard. And uh, <laughs> the idea being that if you build a white box, you know, you build this generic white box, then nobody will complain about it. And if nobody complains, then that's the best you can hope for as an architect. So we're building, we're doing, when we're drawing up these design guides for other architects as well, so um, teaching and working with, uh, on all three of the platforms that we're working on at the moment to uh, talk to other architects about how we can begin to build in prefabricated housing. This one here, this will go on site uh, just after Christmas, and this is 65 apartments here, 151 boxes, all with different kitchens and different bathrooms, different colored bedrooms. And it will look like that when it's finished. This is a social housing development in London. And another one here as well. So these buildings typically take up less than, take less than a year to go up. They're incredibly quiet and efficient as well. And we have uh, similar jobs now in Paris. There's 68 apartments here going on site here. So prefabricated wall elements for this one. In Stockholm, we have a 255 apartment uh, project, which will start next year. And then we've been having a bit of fun as well. So we've been starting to experiment with different types of timber. This one we're doing with the American hardwood people. Don't tell the American softwood people. And so this one is, uh, this is made from tulip wood. So if you all know tulip wood. So this is a timber that um, is typically made into pallets or pulped for cardboard. In fact, the value of it is so low that they really didn't know what to do with it. So they generally throw it away. So what we've done here is to take that and to make it into a CLT. So this arrived in the factory in Scotland in, uh, in March. And then we started making little things out of plywood, thinking what we could do with those. Making little boxes and thinking about three-dimensional stuff that we could do with those. And then we spoke to the Victoria and Albert Museum, and this is the courtyard there, and the London Design Festival. And uh, about three weeks ago, we set, uh, we set this thing up. So this is the CLT being made here. This is being sprayed here. So in, the U in Europe, in the UK, um, we use a, like a water-based adhesive, so that it's a very, very inert adhesive, so no formaldehydes in it, no poisons in it. So you can see these guys here, just kind of, and this is the big glue sprayer here. And then these are the boxes that we built, just like the little plywood ones. In fact, from the same BIM model that we built the plywood ones, we built these ones. And will this work? So five days, little spider crane, we brought them in, wheeled the boxes in and built them up. And so what we've made is this kind of little three-dimensional maze, mostly for children to encourage their parents to come up. But all around the bottom, we've kind of placed these surreptitious little messages about how, imp oh, it's gonna keep going now. <laughs> Actually, I've only seen it once before. But um, all these surreptitious little messages are printed on the boxes about how this is a kind of, you know, a carbon store and how the mysteries of trees are that they absorb carbon dioxide into the, from the atmosphere and they release oxygen and we can build massive buildings out of them. And uh, 
So this is how it finished anyway. So this is us in front of the v &A last week. Good old climate change. From above here, so you can see all the different staircases. So we had this kind of Escher-esque kind of like system of boxes piled on top of each other. And we had six and a half million Instagram impressions from this, which is what it's all about. <laughs> so nicely lit here. But it was, you know, it's so fantastic watching kids running around it, people getting really involved. I would talk to anybody that would listen about it here. And you can see also the cantilever of this box here. So if you imagine each one of these boxes is about 2.8 meters internally. So what's that, just less than just less than 10 feet internally. So each one can take about 30 people. So actually, this, the loading for this is quite incredible. In fact, Arabs think, Arabs told me, the engineer, that this, is the, the, this CLT works harder than any other CLT in any building. And you can imagine that this is uh, a box made of 90 millimeter CLT. So 90 millimeter is, um, what's that, three and a half inches. So everybody running around it. We had about a, just under 100,000 people through in two weeks. I've got so many photographs of this, it was difficult to... Anyway, so we're working on other things as well. So um, also beginning to look at what we can do in terms of height for modular housing and uh, how we can begin to build these buildings, learning some of the lessons from the different types of material that we've been working with. So for us, what started about low carbon, you know, what started about sustainability with ideas around replenishable materials. So using materials that aren't scraped off the surface of our planet, but materials that we can grow, materials that we cut down and can grow more of. And that this journey for us turned into an understanding of healthy buildings, that actually people sleep longer, people, uh, children work harder at schools, People get better in hospitals made of timber faster. Um, the Austrians reckon that you sleep 20 minutes a night longer if you live in a timber building. So that these buildings help rural economies as we become increasingly urban, as we move into our cities and leave the rural communities behind, actually to engage with rural communities, to uh, work with them in terms of, of foresters, etc., is also an incredibly valuable part of this. And that these are beautiful buildings, that these buildings are really solid. They're made of solid materials. So they're not the kind of... The concrete buildings that we build now, you know, which are just kind of like basically concrete floor slabs and drywall, these buildings are solid, robust buildings, buildings that have a great acoustic and a great thermal qualities. And that we can repeat this process, that we can build different buildings with the same methodology and increase productivity so we can increase the amount of buildings that we produce and help to end this terrible urban housing crisis that, that, that affects the whole globe. So we see this more than just building in a different material. We see this as an opportunity for a complete revolution in construction, to completely change the way that we build, to completely change the way that architects interact with construction and design buildings. And this is the, this is the handful of seeds. This is, the, this is the number of tree seeds that it took to grow the trees that built Murray Grove. Thank you. Yeah, I like questions are good. Oh, I have a note from our sponsor as well, look. We wrote a book, uh, we just finished it, and it's available online, free download, uh, called Thinkwood, and it details 100 projects in the UK. They're not all ours. <laughs> and uh, so we have about 500 buildings complete now in the UK, and these are 100, so we interviewed um, over 100 architects, engineers, and clients. And so there are 100 projects detailed in the book. And then also uh, um, some chapters talking about how to design, how to build in timber as well.
chill now. <laughs> it's still, I mean, the thing is, we, you know, it's an incredibly conservative industry. Both development and construction industry are very conservative people. It's very risk averse. You know, so the idea of actually using a brand new material, um, and it is a brand new material still, you know, to use a brand new material to build people's buildings with is something that you do have to push through. And something that you have to be quite kind of um, collaborative about as well, it's quite collegiate about, in the sense that, you know, we make sure that when we first sit down about a project, we sit down with code officials and we cozy up to them and get engineers in the room and, and firemen and all the rest of it. So it's, it's still tough to push through. You have been using some experiments with the tulip wood and finding good results. And bamboo is typically stronger uh, than typical like plywood. When you get bamboo plywood, have you experimented at all with bamboo CLT and any processes in that nature yet? Uh, yeah, no, we haven't yet, but we're talking about it. So we are working with a couple of engineers, just started to, to look at bamboo. I mean, a lot of the bamboo products that you have now in the market like the one I'm currently leaning on, are, um, uh, there's not an awful lot of bamboo in there and there's an awful lot of resin, awful mm -hmm. lot of formaldehyde in there. Yep. So we don't tend to use materials like that, um, but we are looking at bamboo. I mean, it just doesn't behave very well in, you know, it can't get wet. So it's, it's difficult right. in terms of construction and that kind of thing. It doesn't perform well under sun, but you're right. I mean, it's incredibly fast growing and really efficient material. So I think there are great opportunities with bamboo and it will be something that we, I'm sure, look at increasingly in the future. Thanks for your presentation. Very, very interesting. I think you have made very well the case, and, and we're pretty convinced on, on the uh, usability of, of uh, engineer wood as, as a substitute for construction, and especially in these different buildings. But, but you didn't explain a lot or showed a lot about uh, the language of that, of that material. The, the, in a way that, how does it show that it's wood? Yeah. Because especially the buildings that don't show it, yeah. you're, you're making it like a very good substitute for, for, for materials that, are, that have much higher carbon built uh, factors. But, but how does this help to develop? architecture in a sense of tectonics on how yeah. on how this material actually expresses something and then have you had any kind of feedback from users of these buildings of how living in these buildings show or or make their lives better because yeah. of other than you know it's warmer and and it's less more interested in the sort of language of architecture in a way okay so you know when we first started when we first started building in timber and um and it's still largely the case now. We have to prove each building in terms of cost and program. And that's how we get our buildings built. We don't, we don't tend to get many instructions from people who want timber buildings. That's beginning to change, which is really exciting. Um, so that's one of the primary reasons. But you know, the other reason is, is you know, kind of in architecture, you're always, you know, at school, we're always taught to go back to the sketch, you know, to start to go back to the original idea and think about how you employ the original idea as the project becomes more detailed. And for us, the original principle of the idea was replacing concrete and steel with timber. Is it demonstrating that timber is a viable alternative to concrete and steel? Not that timber is another choice alongside concrete and steel, but that it should replace concrete and steel. Now, for me, the fact that it's that you know that there are an aesthetic beauty about it, that there's, you know, that there's um, advantages to being able to see it, is almost secondary in the sense that you know, the big move about this is, is it really is about sustainability. And getting that message out, getting that message out to architects has been incredibly, has been an incredibly important part of what we do. Now, I know how fickle architects are, because I'm, you know. <laughs> and you know what, and, and the thing is about, Architecture, if it's kind of like, if it's exposed timber one year, then it's, you know, then it's marble denim the next year. You know, it's kind of like, so actually really demonstrating the constructional viability of this material has been really an important part of our journey. So that's that. 
although I live in a timber house, I live in a CLT house with lots of exposed CLT and I love it. And um, I'm my own post occupant evaluator. <laughs> and um, I don't know if I sleep 20 minutes more a night, but um, certainly I sleep more now it's finished than when I. Um, <clears throat> So in terms of post-occupancy evaluation, yes, that's something we're working on. Um, we have, uh, I think, three different studies at the moment that are ongoing, and where you know where we're measuring movement, where we're measuring um, heat transfer through the building, we're measuring people's happiness. How you can measure that, you know, but people's satisfaction with the buildings that they live in. So yeah, that's part of our part of an ongoing kind of research that we do. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. I was fascinated by how you incorporate this uh, veneer birch, uh, veneer birch in um, maybe taller buildings as well. Yeah. Um, what do you think the limit would be to in terms of building taller when you mix in these veneer columns? I, I, and why did you make the choice, or how did you make the choice between like lulam versus veneer birch? as a structural column or well, element? The, to answer your second question first, I mean, yeah. it, that's, um, that's really because the veneer is so much stronger. Okay. You know, so if we have a beam that's two feet thick in, in an LVL, mm -hmm. then that would probably be four or five foot thick in glue lamb. I mean, it really is that much stronger. Yeah. So um, for us, it really has been about using the best material, the most suitable material in, 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 the, in that place for that use. Um, in terms of the tool There's a question. competition going on. About, Sorry? There's a competition going on about Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I refer you back to the kind of fickle point I made before about architects. You know, there's been a lot of buildings in a lot of magazines where somebody's, you know, got out the brown felt tip and colored it in brown and said it's made of timber, you know, and I think that the danger of that is that we end up with a lot of pictures of tall timber buildings and no actual tall timber buildings. And so I think it's one of these things, you know, we need to get right. Going back to the sketch again, I mean, it's a difficult thing to say in Manhattan, of all places, but I'm not sure that tall buildings are always the answer. Mm. You know, I don't think tall buildings necessarily make the best cities. You know, they don't make the best cities for old people or for children. They don't bring light to our streets. They're hard to make sustainable just in terms of getting people around and servicing those buildings. So I'm not sure if a race to produce these tall buildings is the right race. And the other thing as well is that for a lot of these buildings, what they're doing, and, and you, you know we're guilty of doing it ourselves, is, that, is they're making concrete buildings out of timber. And I think for me what, I'm, you know, what our practice is really about at the moment is trying to understand what kind of architecture will be produced from building with a different material. Now, if you think over 100 years ago when we started building with concrete, reinforced concrete, that's really what allowed these buildings to be so super tall and the steel and the steel frames. So going with a different type of building material, I could see a different type of structure, a different type of architecture, and a different type of city. OK, I have the microphone, so I'm going to hug it for two quick questions. Um, was in Paris project, did you use Technywood by curiosity on the envelope? In which project, sorry? Um, the Paris project. Yeah. Um, have you run into the firm Technywood in terms of CLT envelope solutions? Very lightweight, interspersed with uh, insulation panels. Um, uh, we've used some kind of prefabricated wall panels and external cladding panels. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But not the ones you're talking not about. Not Technywood, okay. <laughs> um, also amazing to see how you use concrete there in the factory. Yeah. Uh, you found out just a quick way to sort of incorporate that quickly. How quickly can you get that concrete type of floor uh, set? It takes in? a while to set. Okay. It takes a while to set. And um, it's just how the Romans did it. Oh. You know, <laughs> okay. it's not so, um, but it's about looking at how we can reduce the amount of cement that we use and um, about kind of not piling so deeply, not leaving kind of such massive scars in the earth around us. How long did it take to set? Um, from memory, about four weeks. Okay. Cool. Thanks. 
Hi, uh, thanks for coming. Great talk. Um, you mentioned um, about how timber could create an opportunity for a new kind of architecture, a new vernacular of architecture. Um, is this something that you have experienced so far in your practice, or are you still on the stage of kind of replacing concrete with timber and then getting to the new Do building you know, type next? I beat myself up about. I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I don't think it's as binary. The answer is like either you are or you're not. I think it's progressive and certainly I can look back on some of our buildings and think of them as sort of as like duck billed platypuses in terms of the evolution of architecture <laughs> and uh, you know knowing that that's the wrong way to have gone and um, but it, so I think it's kind of like you know it's a generative thing it will happen over time for sure but I think that it you know I'm always you know, always looking at the work that we've done, trying to understand how using the different material might have influenced the architecture of that building. Hi, thank you so much for the talk. Um, I had a question about the waste. So if the um, if they're CNC, um, what happens to the cutout parts and what also happens to the chips that are generated from that? And does it, um, and with the glue, even if it's water-based, like how does that um, play out in the waste? Um, that's a good question. So for most of the CLT plants, they use the smaller cutouts from the, from the CNC, -ing. they use those, they chip them, and they, they, make, they put them in a biomass to make electricity. So they, they're used as fuel to generate the buildings uh, to generate electricity for the buildings um, and to power the plant and in fact most of the uh, most of the manufacturing plants that we work with are completely off-grid and actually use the uh, and use that chipped timber entirely for their fuel um, what we're now seeing as well is um, the recycling of CLT panels so actually factories now um, emerging in, in Austria where they can use larger portions of CLT and actually put those together and use them as a low-grade CLT panel, which I think is really interesting. Um, in terms of the adhesives, the adhesives that we use um, in Europe, the, the, the polyurethane adhesives, um, they're so inert that actually you can, use the, you can use timber that's been glued together with those adhesives, you can use that you can still pulp it for paper, you can still use it for fuel, um, and uh, so it's, it, it's, it makes very little effect for it. The problem comes when you use formaldehyde-based adhesives, and then those become a little bit more difficult to work with. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation. It was really interesting to hear that uh, timber could be cost-efficient. Could you share some details about like the cost analysis you made with maybe previous uh, like re reinforced concrete materials? Yeah. And how much percentage did you um, predict it could be cheaper or? Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> you know the thing is the the one thing that catches you out in that question is that um, the timber companies always seem to price the timber at about the right price, so it's just a little bit cheaper than concrete. <laughs> and when the price of concrete fluctuates, you tend to find that, lo and behold, the price of timber fluctuates too. <laughs> so, I, you know, difficult to answer that question. It is a lot less expensive than it used to be now even. Um, and the volume of production means that it's less ex increasingly less expensive. Um, the way in which we were able to demonstrate the cost effectiveness of the timber was not by merely taking the concrete out of the equation and putting in timber, but was to talk about all the kind of demonstrable advantages of the material, the different kinds of savings that you get through the speed of construction, the different kinds of savings that you get uh, through the labor force, through delivery, all of that kind of thing. So really going quite deep into an understanding of what you pay for when you buy a building. Hi, being, I, I'm sorry, I just wanted to add, I think that it's, you know, I think that architects often tend to be quite compliant about that kind of thing. You know, they get a cost back from a cost consultant and they go, oh, wow, that's the cost. You know, there's not a lot of interrogation goes on. And I would just really advise 
you know, be in charge of that kind of thing. And that we found when we started to interrogate that, and we started to really look into it and find out what people were telling us was not true about how much our buildings were costing. Hi, thank you for your talk. I think I could see there are a lot of great qualities in timber buildings, but to address the elephant in my room is, what if there is a fire, especially in one of these taller nine-story or even taller buildings? I just can't figure it out. Thank you. No, of course. So we're, you know, we're really aware about the fact that we build buildings from a combustible material, and we're very careful. And I think that, you know, the architects, you know, we've had a recent tragedy in the UK, um, as you know, in Grenfell, with a concrete tower burning down. And I think what that demonstrated is that everybody in architecture needs to be careful. You know that concrete will shale and explode at about 230 degrees C, and steel will begin to lose its structural integrity at about 270 degrees C. And most European softwoods won't ignite until they're over 280 degrees C. So actually timber, along with other materials, you know, it, it, loses, it loses its integrity under fire, but alongside all other materials. So you need to be careful. One needs to be careful as an architect and responsible for those things. But I live on the seventh story of a timber building. Great, thank you. Right over here. Um, Thank you for your presentation, I thought it was great. Thank you. Um, during your presentation, I was just thinking about economies of scale, and as we tend to, I guess, have a paradigm shift towards more sustainable development, we tend to use CLT as a viable resource. I'm just concerned about how that may impact natural ecosystems yeah. and the biodiversity of those natural ecosystems as we start to, let's say, monoculturally grow materials to supply urban development? Yeah, I mean, that's, a, that's an excellent question. And it's something that we, we, you know, we talk about a lot in the office and with different timber companies. And that we've worked with uh, Yale School of Forestry to research into that. Now, it, at the moment it, in Europe, the tr you know, we're still, even though they're not planting that many trees anymore, actually the growth of forests still outstrips the amount of timber that's cut down from them every year. Um, so a lot of the trees that, that we use, the timber that we use, was planted 60, 70 years ago for the paper industry, and we don't really use paper like that anymore. So, there is, so we have this, this massive existing uh, planted sustainable forest system. Um, all, of the, all of the timber that we use is certified um, to the extent that every tree that's cut down is cut down to a metre and a half. In, and that trunk and those roots and the branches from that trunk are all left in situ in order to be able to make sure that the land remains fertile for, for more trees to grow. And for every tree that is cut down, another five are grown in its place. So a lot of the problems that you're experiencing now in the US, particularly with forest fires, with beetle infestation, all those sorts of things, they're actually coming from the fact that you're not cutting trees down anymore that you grew these trees and now you're leaving them there. So lots of the problems are about that. It would just be like, you know, if we suddenly turn vegetarian and all our cows and sheep, you know, went a bit mental. Uh, hello, uh, thank you for your presentation. I have um, just two questions and uh, adding to the one that uh, the lady made is uh, towards the, uh, danger of a fire, uh, you say that you have to be careful, but I'm thinking exactly how do you put any okay. sort of product to protect the, those panels? Then also for, imagine that one day you get to make uh, the buildings that you showed us with the timber uh, exposed. Do you have to have any considerations regarding UV uh, rays? And also how long do these buildings um, like the lifetime. Okay. How long Good. Will it okay. Take? So in terms of the fire, there, are, there, are, I guess, there are four different ways of coping with fire in timber buildings. The, primarily, we know exactly what timber will do under fire. So we know that that a European spruce will burn at 0.76 millimeters per minute, and that is dependable. And that as it burns, it chars. So as the as the timber burns, just like as in a forest, as the timber burns, 
it has a char layer on the outside which protects that timber. So every piece of structure in our buildings is overstructured such that there can be a burning layer on that timber which will then help to self-protect it. The other thing that we do is cover lots of the walls in drywall in order to fire protect them as well. We can also paint them with an intumescent. We tend, you know, with a fire retardant paint. We tend not to do that because then that um, reduces the, the hydroscopic quality of the material. It stops it from being able to breathe, to accept and release moisture. So we tend to avoid those. Um, and obviously the, the fourth way is to sprinkle the buildings, you know, and to make sure that they have kind of adequate fire protection systems within them. So that was one thing. In terms of the UV degradation, um, yes, you're absolutely right. I mean, external uh, cladding on timber, the thermally modifying the timber prevents it from being degraded to the same degree uh, by, um, by UV. And also just understanding what the material will do and how to protect it. So how to work with those things, understanding the science of that material. Um, and then the third question was, the lifespan. The lifespan. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, Timber, you know, you can unscrew these buildings and flat pack them down and move them to another place, <laughs> as we demonstrate. So the, 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 um, the tulip wood boxes, actually, they moved from the Victoria and Albert Museum on Sunday, and then today they were reinstalled outside an exhibition center in another part of London. And How long will those panels be able to move from one place to another? You know, with that, it's you know, with that, obviously they will degrade the number of times they keep on being built and rebuilt and built and rebuilt. But they'll be in New York, I think, in February, so you should be able to see them then, um, and then in Madrid, and then in Milan, and that's what so far. So they're going, but you know, in all seriousness, the kind of we have a church just outside of London that was built in um, eleven thirty A.D. from timber frame, and the same church is still standing today. I don't see any reason why not. I mean, the, the, the chemical change in the adhesive is a catalyst, you know, it's, it's catalyzed, and, and so it's a, a literal chemical change in that material. So I don't see why that should break down or degrade. And you need to look after timber, you know, protect it from the rain and from the sun, etc. But I don't see any reason why it would degrade beyond that. I mean, one of the fascinating, and I'm a bit geeky, I know this, I kind of. I'll <laughs> watch the room, but one of the fascinating things is actually the longer that a screw is in a piece of timber, the stronger that connection becomes. So not the weaker, but the stronger, because actually the, the, the timber itself ossifies around the screw. So the joint becomes stronger over time. And in fact, the, the ceilings to the Great Pyramids of the tunnels in the Great Pyramids are made from a doweled cross-laminated timber still in place. Hi, Andrew. Um, I have a, a less technical question. Um, as somebody who's really well steeped in the European uh, mass timber economy, I assume that you speculate about the future of that economy in Europe, and I assume you also speculate about the future of your practice in that economy. So I'm wondering if, if you could Every speak... Every day. What's that? Every day. Every day. <laughs> so I'm wondering if you could speak to possible um, speculations that you have about a mass timber economy in, in rural econ in rural areas mm. or in emerging economies and the role that you and your firm might might play in those areas? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. So we you know, we're still trying to get we're still trying to get used to the work that we're now doing as a practice because it's been quite a surprise to us what's happened to our practice and the interest that we've had. So, you know, we are doing things like um, uh, working with a Brazilian company on a design guide for their CLT in Brazil. We've done work in New Zealand. We're doing work in Singapore at the moment. Um, you know, we, we, we hope to work more and more abroad. We've done some work in Malaysia looking at how they can um, use the timbers, the eucalyptus and, and other timbers in Malaysia in order to build CLT. So really working with quite rural communities understanding actually how they can form industries that will give value to the to the trees that they have so i mean brazil is a great example so in brazil what they're now doing you know is to, is looking to regrow the rainforests and to populate those rainforests with some um lower grade trees that can be felled 
in order to help pay for the replanting of the rainforest. So an understanding that, you know, in the UK, it became illegal to use mahogany in buildings about 20 years ago. And then, you know, about a year later, you see all the site hoarding is all sheathed in mahogany plywood. <laughs> you know, so then there was a ban on that eventually. And, and then I was on a construction site a few months ago and a, and a pallet of bricks arrived. And the pallet that the bricks were being held on was made of mahogany. You know, so it's not stopping the companies. The, the way in which to, to care for our forests is to give them value. You know, you give the trees the lumber value and you enhance those local communities, you enhance the, the, um, the future of the forest. Uh, as one of the world's leading timber gurus, the way you get around uh, the globe and share your practice, how do you deal with the environmental imperative that you care so much about that we have to change the way we build buildings? How do you, what do you, we need to do to get the world to pay attention to that? And how do you go about getting people to pay attention to that? Um, by, by talking, I think, by talking, by building, by doing what we're doing here and now, um, and um, by being relentless about it. You know, um, we, um, a guy in my office, it wasn't me, somebody in my office did a talk at a university um, a couple of weeks ago because we were invited by the student association to do a talk at the university this early this year and um, he told me the next day that all the students in the audience knew who our practice was and none of the tutors did so I think that you know when I was a kid at high school we were taught about recycling and how important recycling was and I would never not recycle it's just kind of part of my um, in my DNA and I know that, you know, from my own kids, that actually the level of understanding that they have about climate change through education, through, you know, from an early age, means that the architects that are coming through now, the architects that are qualifying now at school now, are architects which will take that kind of problem incredibly seriously, that will, that will face climate change, that will see that as an opportunity to express, to build, and to, and to you know to build a better society and one that's more relevant today than the buildings that we a lot of the buildings that we see going up around us. I think that's probably a very good note to close on. So thank you very much for the spectacular talk. So Thank you, and Andrew. I, I want to be able to call all your attention to, in part, the, the answer to the question is talking and having a conversation between students, between faculty, between practitioners, engineers, developers, uh, environmentalists, and others who really have to come together. So the, in part, this is the nature and the intent of the Timber in the City conferences. Uh, this will continue tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. in this room. Uh, there are three panels, one at 10, one at 1 o'clock, and one at 3.30, each addressing different aspects of the real challenges, what's at stake for architecture in the cities in reimagining and reinventing using timber as a base material. So I invite you all to come tomorrow at 10 o'clock or in the afternoon. It's identified in the brochure uh, who is coming, but right now also join for a reception uh, and drinks where we can celebrate and thank Andrew for this spectacular talk. Thank you.